Well, I'm Jim Large, and uh, we're here in Much Markle, near Ledbury, and it's the 25th of October. Now, what did you do? You were a chartered surveyor. Can you tell us what the chartered surveyor did in relation to hops? Um, the chartered surveyors uh, have a number of different uh, practices. Uh, I was under the Rural Practice Division, so we tended to do agricultural work uh, and rural property work. Um, and so it was through that that I became involved in the hop surveys. Lovely. Perfect. That's what I love. Um, so tell us about the hop surveys, John. I have a numbering to put that in your answer. <laughs> I was with a firm called CT and GH Smith and we were auctioneers in Ledbury and we ran the cattle market and did an awful lot of rural and agricultural business and one of the uh, jobs that we did each year in the spring of each year was hop surveying and that's where we acted on behalf of the hops marketing board and we visited um, hop farms in the area that we were asked by the board to visit to uh, measure and survey any alterations they had made in their hop yards. For example, they may grub out an acre of fuggles and leave that unplanted for a season, we would measure that. Or they may uh, plant up a different variety and we would note that and return that information to the hops marketing board. Yes, the mapping side of it was interesting. Um, the, the maps that we had to use in those days, and I'm talking about the 1960s and the 1970s when I was personally involved, um, the ordnance survey maps we used in those days were usually dating from about 1908, 1928, um, and they were what we call the 25-inch map. So um, it was sort of uh, 25 inches to the mile. And they were very detailed maps. Um, all the fields were given their own numbers and their acreages. And those were the maps that we used on our surveys. And on the library of maps that we had, and we had a specific library for our hop survey work, um, the hop yards were marked on the fields um, and whenever there was an alteration carried out that we surveyed, we would draw that part of the hop yard with a pencil line. Um, so it, it may be that right in the middle of a hop yard, a farmer will have grubbed up an acre of hops. So we would measure where that stretch was and measure it on the plan with pencil lines, bearing in mind that hop wire work is parallel. So you'd end up on, after a few years, because we never rub these lines out, um, seeing this series of parallel pencil lines uh, on the map. And then, usually on site, we would work out the acreage so that we could put the acreages on the, far, uh, on the forms whilst we were out on the farm and get the, f the farmer to sign the form, and it was all ready then to send off uh, once we got back to the office. So tell us about the quota system then. Ah, the quota system, right. Well, the quota system was introduced um, shortly after the Hops Marketing Board um, came into being. Uh, the Hops Marketing Board came into being in 1931, uh, sorry, 1932, and then in 1934 they introduced the quota system. Um, and the quota system was had really two purposes. It was firstly to regulate the quantity of hops that were grown and also to regulate the price. So each farm was allocated a hop quota um, and that quota was called a basic quota and it was allotted um, on the basis of uh, previous year's production to get, uh, and, they, and so each farm was allocated a basic quota. Um, now that quota was not based on the acreage of hops but it was based on weight. And it was a very interesting um, unit of weight called a Zentner, Z-E-T-N, 
Z-E-T-N-E-R, which was an old German um, unit of weight. And a Zentner, in modern terms, is um, very similar to 50 kilograms, or prior to metric, it was very similar to 100 weight. So a Zentner was more or less, in those days, equivalent to 100 weight. And so a farm would be allocated so many Zentners, basic hop quota. Um, and then each year, at the beginning of the year, the hops marketing board would calculate the demand that was likely to be for hops in, in that year uh, based on uh, what the merchants thought that they would need. And so um, the farm was given an annual quota each year, which was not necessarily the same as the basic quota. And if it was felt that there wasn't going to be quite the demand that year nationally from the, from the, from the brewers for, for, for the usual number of hops, then the annual quota may well be a percentage of the basic. Um, so you had two quotas, really, basic and annual, all in this lovely sort of uh, weight unit of a Zentner. Yes, um, you had a situation with hop quotas that if uh, a, a farmer was allocated his annual quota, he may find out, fi end up growing less than his annual quota will allow. He's, he's short. In, um, and it would be possible if he were able to find a, a grower that was in surplus that he could buy some annual quota from that source to make up his own. If a farmer uh, had a surplus and was unable to sell that to a grower um, who was short of quota, then he could still pick his hops and he would put them in what was called a pool. Um, so at the end of the day, the hops marketing board would have a certain quantity of hops in a pool for which they would get paid something. They wouldn't get paid the full rate, but they would get something. And it was sold for money, was it? Or was it sold for... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want that to say that? Yeah, OK. Yeah, well, sure. you mean that what they would what they would pay for it? Uh, yeah, what they, yeah, yeah that, just... it, that the pool was something people would take bits at and you'd pay for no, it? No, it, so the hops would be there. Um, but they would only get uh, um, a portion of the value f for them, yeah. Um, but how that was calculated, I don't know. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, just just tell us about the hop marketing board. What was it? What did it do? Well, as the hops marketing board um, was formed in 1932 uh, with the idea that it would control the amount of hops being grown in the country, and it would regulate the price. So the hops marketing board were very instrumental in the price system. Um, and the hops marketing board existed right the way through to the early 80s, when the UK at that time had joined the EEC. The hops marketing board was created in 1932, um, with the dual role, really, of firstly regulating the amount of hops that were grown in the country and also um, controlling and regulating the price the grower was paid. And the hops marketing board worked well and it went right through to the early 80s. And then in 1982, after Britain had joined the EEC, the European Economic Community, um, the EEC decided it was too much of a monopoly and it had to come to an end. And so it, it, it ceased to exist in 1982. Yeah. So you weren't saw, seen as a big bureaucratic, you were just doing something to help their, their trade? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, so the, um, the relationship with the hops market is board and the grower I think was good it was there to regulate things uh, the, the growers knew where they stood with it um, and I think altogether it was um, successful in fact rather interestingly when the hops marketing board came to an end in 1982 um, it continued in the form of a private organization of the hops marketing board limited um, and so it was obviously felt that there was a need for some form of control and regulation. Ah, that was good. That's yeah. interesting.
And then it became English hops, I think. Yeah. <laughs> there were hop factors and hop merchants. Um, the hop factor acted in the interests of the grower. And before the hops marketing board came into force, the hop factors were the grower's agents. Uh, and then when the hops marketing board came into existence, they became the growers agents and the hops marketing board agents. The hop, mer the the merchants were the agents for the brewers, and so you had those two, two sides, the two agencies on each side: merchant, uh, uh, brewers, and growers. It must have been a very busy time, was it? Did you, I must wonder if you can describe that that period of work. At the time that we did the hop surveys each year um sorry yeah, yeah i'm running i'm sorry, sorry it was Jim, should we start again yes yes sorry. yes when the time came each year to do our hop surveys it was really something we looked forward to um because for a period of say six weeks it got us out of the office for two or three days a week um and we would be visiting farms that probably we would not normally visit in any other circumstance my firm seating gh smith did the hop surveys for Herefordshire. So we would cover the farms throughout Herefordshire. And um, so the way it would work is that we would have been sent by the hops marketing board all the forms uh, for the farms that we had to visit. So we would say, right, we're out tomorrow doing hop surveys. We'll go into such and such an area and we would pick the farms in that area. It may have been eight farms, may have been 10 farms. I've even done 12 in a day, but 10 would be a good day's work. And you'd ring those farmers up the night before, and you would say that we'd like to come and do your hop survey. We hope to be with you such and such a time, and you would arrive on the farm. And either the farmer would be there, or he'd left instructions with somebody to show you the work that had been done in those yards. And uh, it was fascinating because it really got you out into this beautiful county of ours, uh, onto farms, as I say, that many of which you perhaps wouldn't normally go onto. Well, certainly farming has changed. I mean, for me personally, what the big change has been that um, I moved from Herefordshire with my work in 1982, um, and we've just moved back in the last two or three years. But the big change from the hop point of view is the substantial reduction in the acreage of hops being grown and I drive around the countryside in areas that I've known and suddenly where there were hop yards there are no longer hop yards and it's very much moved forward from moved on from hops to, to fruit but rather interestingly um, there is a growing demand for traditional varieties of hops because of this tremendous growth of microbreweries um, and it's turning around I think slightly and some of the, the traditional hops that were needed for beer are now being sought after. One important and quite interesting side of hop growing was uh, the shows in the autumn and in this area those two the shows would have been at two main ploughing matches the, the Lebury ploughing match and the trumpet ploughing match and both of those um, ploughing societies had large hop shows with a lot of classes. And because certainly in the days that I was very involved with it back in the 60s and 70s, when lots of hops were being grown, those shows were, were quite big and well supported. Um, and that was fascinating and it was a great community event and it was quite competitive the far with the farmers uh, showing their samples of hops. Um, Another interesting uh, involvement my firm had with, with the hop growing was the auctions in November of each year of hop roots. Um, and uh, we used to hold our auctions in the Catamark in, in Ledbury. Um, and I recall that it would be quite common to have, say, 20,000 hop roots for sale there. And there would be some local hop growers who would actually uh, grow um, cuttings in nursery beds to create new roots uh, for the purpose of putting them up for sale. And so we would have in our market um, uh, several thousand um, hop roots in bundles. Um, the most popular variety in those days would have been Fuggles. But we also had um, 
hop routes uh, from other parts of the country. Um, for example, Norfolk um, was an area where uh, they grew hop roots for selling on to hop growers. Um, and we would get samples come down from Norfolk. And I recall that, for example, we would get samples of Northern Brewer hop roots and they would be sent by the, uh, the growers in East Anglia by train. We'd pick them up at Lebury Railway Station. And when we had our auction, there would be a sample of those routes so they would so if the growers in norfolk had five thousand northern brewers for sale they wouldn't send five thousand down to ledbury they would send a sample bundle for the farmers to see and then they would be auctioned and that we'd ask the farmer how many they want and they might want a thousand so up to auction again until we'd sold them all what was the what was the atmosphere like at these auctions yeah, I'd recall it quite interesting. I think any auction at the, uh, in a cattle market always draws a good crowd. Um, obviously, it would be totally different to our livestock market because it would be very, very sp specific. And so the, the, the people attending would be hop growers. But yeah, there was always a good atmosphere. And of course, there was always a, a even better atmosphere in the market in the ring of bells after. Excellent. <laughs> did, did any deals happen in the ring of bells? Was any exchange shaking hands and making deals in there? If there were, we as auctioneers weren't told about it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you wouldn't want to know about that. I, I know this isn't about hops, but it might be quite good to talk about, um, interesting to touch on Colin, Colin Manning and how you knew him and how he got you into the business. Yes. <clears throat> Colin Manning, a uh, very well-known auctioneer in, in Hereford, and uh, I go right back to my school boy days uh, knowing Colin. And uh, I was at the uh, grammar school in Hereford, which was immediately opposite Hereford Market as it was then. And I recall in my mid-teens um, quite frequently walking across the road in the lunch hour just to sit and watch the auctioneers selling the cattle and selling the sheep. And I remember Colin being one of those. And I, at that time, decided that I wanted to be an auctioneer. Um, and uh, my mother was very friendly with Mrs. Manning. And uh, so we asked Colin if there was a vacancy with his firm in Hereford. And he said at the time there wasn't, but he knew a firm in Lebury that was looking for a school leaver. And Colin drove me over to Lebury um, uh, to meet the partner of Seating G.H. Smith. Probably the shortest interview um, I will have ever had. Um, and um, I was offered the job. And that was the start of my school leaving work in auctioneering in Lebury. Your, your company sits... Seating G.H. Smith, Smith. Yeah. Were you buying for business when it came to surveying hops with other chartered surveyors? Was it quite a competitive or did you have loyal customers year after year? No, the hops marketing board uh, was the organisation that we did the hop surveys for and they had appointed our firm as their surveyors for Herefordshire and uh, my firm had been doing hop surveys for the board for many, many years and still continue to do so after I'd moved away and uh, went down to Cornwall. And there would have been then other firms in other counties doing the same. The, uh, it was a little interesting system on hop samples because uh, the hops would leave the farm in their Hessian hop pockets, um, having been dried and pressed. Um, but the whole system of price was very much down to the value of the samples. So samples had to be obtained so that the factors, the hop factors, could ascertain the quality of the hops and also the merchants likewise would want to ascertain the quality of those hops. Um, and so they had a sim uh, system of taking hop samples which was actually taking a little cube-shaped uh, sample from a pocket of hops. Now each pocket um, was numbered as, as a pocket was uh, was filled um, in, in the hop kiln. Um, it was numbered and every pocket 
that had a number ending in number five was the pocket that had to be sampled. And so it was important that those uh, pockets that ended in number five were prioritised to get to the warehouse in Ledbury fairly quickly um, so, uh, so that those samples could be taken. The, probably the first time the farm, the growers, saw their samples was when the samples were taken for the for the for the show. You're not recording this, uh, no, oh, or is it? Yeah. Oh right, sorry. Well, it just sounded like it. Do you mind if we do? <laughs> no, fine. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 yeah okay, we're recording yeah, too. Okay. Another interesting little aside to this is that um, probably the first time um, a grower saw an official sample was perhaps when it was taken to take to a show. But uh, it was also very important that the growers could see all of their samples. And so the factors would have all their samples to be assessed. Uh, and the samples would be taken to the factor, which would probably have been in Paddock Wood in Kent. Um, and there the samples were all displayed. And so it was common for the growers to have a day or two down in Kent and London to look at their samples. So it was very much a nice, another little social occasion that came out of that process. Okay. You've talked about the, uh, the, the tools of the trade of a surveyor on a, uh, on a hop survey. Um, very few tools needed really, just a map uh, and a tape measure. And then we had um, a little machine called a planometer. Um, in a lot of cases, we could calculate the air areas by just a simple mathematical calculation because, because the hop wire work is parallel, you were actually working out the area of a rectangle. But quite often, if you were dealing with the edge of the hop yard where there was an uneven shaped boundary, then we would use this little machine called a planometer, which was a machine that had uh, a, a steel bar with... Um, with, with markings on it, measurement markings on it, and, and a little wheel that again had, had markings on it. And uh, then we popped another bar onto it and held the end of that onto the, the table or onto the map. And then the, at the end of the first bar was a, a, a little needle, for want of a better description. And then you would trace the outline of the area that you wanted to measure. And then once you've gone completely around it, you would then read off the acreage on the little wheel. Thank you so much for yes. your help. You've yeah. been an absolute dream. Um, we need to um, evaluate the project. And I wonder if we could ask you um, if you could comment on whether you feel recording stories like these are important or not, as the case might be. I think recording the history of anything is, is absolutely vital. Um, and particularly with my involvement in agricultural, I think it's so important. I mean, I was so impressed with the film Chewing the Cud and the historical elements of the old cattle market. And I think hop growing has been such a feature of Herefordshire, uh, but it's changed so much and, so, and, and a lot of it has disappeared that I think recording the history of it, particularly going back to the hand-picking days, is so important. And I think... Although there have been lots of books written on the, these subjects, there's nothing like listening to somebody talking about it. After we've done our survey in the hop yard, uh, we would go back to the farm office with our maps or the bonnet of the car, and we would transpose onto the map the measurements that we had taken in the hop yard. So for example, the particular section of hop yard that we've just been to see, where they've grubbed out uh, fuggle hop roots, um, was 100 feet wide. Uh, from the last line that we drew two years ago, when they'd done some, some other work. So we've got that map, that line already on the map. So we draw our 100 feet from the last line mark two years ago, mark it at each end, bearing in mind they're parallel lines because it's hop wire work. And we draw our line on the map. And then that is the acreage that we have to calculate. Being a nice rectangle, the easiest way of doing it is just to measure the length, which is 910 feet, measure that by the width, and then we calculate the area. If it had been 
a, a more uneven boundary at that point, we would have used our little plan meter machine. So this is how we may well have approached um, plotting uh, our areas on the map after we've done our survey. So we've been into the hop yard. Um, we know from a previous year, this line here is where some work had been done. And we know from our measurements today that the next lot of work where some hops had been grubbed out carried on from that line there and we'd measured it on site as being 100 feet. So with the scale rule, we measure off 100 feet and because the wire work is parallel, we can measure, we can take that 100 feet all the way down and draw another line. And that is the area there which we have to calculate. In a case like this where it's a nice um, rectangle, we can measure that length there, which is 910 feet, multiply that by 100, and we can work out the area of that rectangular. If it had been a more awkward boundary um, on one side, then we would have used the plan meter. But basically, it's as simple as that.